Our course, uh, Critical Race Theory, Representation, and the Rule of Law, explored the way law constructs race, gender, class, and sexual orientation through legal jurisprudence and pulled on African diasporic artistic representations of both those constructions and their attendant responses. Here I'll pull together some of the major themes of the course that stood out for me as a student and create my own representation of the work, the, the readings, films, visual art objects, and discussions did by reviewing some key thought authors and film Films explored throughout the course. While the slides and visual images serve to connect the themes I mentioned with visual renderings, they simultaneously produce their own narrative of the relationship between text and discourse and the production of individual subjectivities. Read together, the audio and visual produce a multi-layered narrative of the themes running through our course on critical race theory. Critical race theory challenges the, quote, historical centrality and complicity of law in upholding white supremacy, end quote, and highlights constructed notions of universal law and reason in order to contest representations of law and master discourses. Reason, working in the seat of God, has become essentialized and as such has worked as a tool of whiteness or Eurocentric notions of the great chain of being to shape the framework of the law. Working to expose these ways contemporary law practi practices are deeply tied up in reproducing whiteness, maleness, and capitalism, CRT scholars, majority of whom are people of color, approach producing interdisciplinary scholarship on the law and racism with a radical lens. As the law masks itself in the neutral language of objectivity and uses that language to mark itself good and just, the criminalized subject or person becomes the antithesis of that which is good. The film, Cultural Criticism and Transformation, features bell hooks, who presents the notion of interlocking systems of domination, which highlights the way race, class, sexual orientation, and gender oppression are interdependent. In the case of the law, this notion can be understood uh, can be used to understand the way binary constructions, good and bad, moral and immoral, white and right, not white and bad, are inextricably linked. While a law is constructed by whiteness and private property, it is simultaneously dependent on racism and the dispossession of property to maintain itself. CRT scholar Kimberly Crenshaw notes, We began to think of our project as uncovering how law was a constitutive element of race itself. In other words, how law constructed race. CRT scholars use race as a lens from which to challenge these conflated constructions, while often simultaneously drawing from both civil rights discourse as well as the Marxist analytical frame critical legal st studies offers. Crenshaw notes that a CRT was birthed in the 80s and its scholars began to draw on social constructionist notions of the subject in order to place CRT in a wider intellectual and social current while connecting uh, connecting that with their own subject positions within the institutions they work in, as well as the positions from which they struggle. Similarly, their discursive tools and strategies are bound by this frame and mirrors the framework of intersectionality with uh, which the radical black feminists of the Kambahi River Collective mandate draw on to produce their political platform. This social constructionist lens has been employed by cultural studies scholar Stuart Hall. In representation, cultural representation, and signifying practices, Hall explores the representation between, uh, excuse me, the relationship between representation and culture. For Hall, representations are constitutive. Um, they create the world, they constitute the images, discourses, and frames of reference that all of us draw on in order to make meaning and build relationships. Likewise, the film, Representation in uh, the Media, Stuart Hall exposes how power attempts to make meanings and representations inert or static. He suggests that this is a flawed project since meanings are always slippery and contextualized. If meanings are, are not fixed, always in flux, moving, not static, then there is great potential to produce different codes and cultural maps. Other folks interested in understanding the relationships between power have also drawn on this social constructionist lens, namely the prison abolition movement. Angela Davis in her book, Are Prisons Obsolete?, historically situates the prison industry and traces the relationship between crime, punishment, and modernity, which gives way to her holistic analysis of the prison industrial complex and, uh, its attendant globalization. By looking at these interlocking systems of domination, D 
Davis illustrates how work against prisons must fall in line with the work to abolish other interlocking forms of oppression. This holistic view uproots the illusion of the fixed and impenetrable position these institutions have come to represent in contemporary media. If representations are constitutive, then producing different representations of prison could on some level work to abolish the prison system. Exploring the way science has worked to classify um, all deviant bodies, non-white and non-heterosexual, through a similar panoptic gaze, scholar Siobhan Somerville, in, in her work, Scientific Racism and the Homosexual Body, looks at how science conflates the tools that define race with the tools that define sexuality. She suggests the structures and methodologies that drove dominant ideologies of race also fueled the pursuit of scientific knowledge about the homosexual bo body. Both sympathetic and hostile accounts of homosexuality were steeped in assumptions that had driven previous scientific studies of race. In the film Race, the Floating Signifier, Stuart Hall notes that science has worked to guarantee absolute difference and fix systems of ca classification, specifically in terms of race. Hall highlights how culture has become a metaphor for nature and vice versa. Once a group has been naturalized into a race, it is taken out of history and fixed into the illusion of holding a stable or natural position. This similar type of essentializing has occurred in the feminist movement. Bell Hooks in Feminist Theory from Margin to Center highlights the white supremacist and classist silencing of difference in order to bring in the feminist movement in order to bring all women under one political umbrella. In effect, this silences those difference be differences between women that determine their relationship to whiteness and patriarchy which in many senses parallels the semantics of legal jurisprudence in its use of intentional absences, what it leaves out, what it emphasizes, and what constitutes its narrative structure. This uh, notion of silences and absences relates to the work of Toni Morrison in her book Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. Morrison um, notes the silenced or unseen presence of enslaved Africans in American literature, suggesting that this type of absent presence is the dichotomy which constructions of whiteness rely on. While some CRT scholars look toward the silences and absences in texts as tools to understand power, other scholars look to the way districting and maps are constructed to represent different communities. Both highlight how the privileging of certain representations renders others invisible. The work of the film The Bombing of Osage Avenue uses Tony Kane Bambara as narrator who situates the move, organization, and bombing within a history of contestations of space in Philadelphia from the 1800s to the move bombing in 1985. Tracing these tensions between land, property, and power as they're conflated with race, the film suggests that while the appearance of the tensions may have changed over time, uh, the dialectics between power and political interest have not. The film performs a visual excavation of power in the same way that Toni Morrison does a discursive excavation. In this sense, the film produces a counter-memory or a counter-narrative to the narrative produced by mainstream media to legitimate the move bombing. Rendering this absent narrative into history, the film brings the past into the present through its representation on the story of Osage Avenue and counteracts the tactful tools of whiteness um, sorry, tactful, to, tactful tools of forgetting so conflated with whiteness and the use of displacement to trace its genealogy. The move house is one location where members of a community decided not to fully participate in the social contract of the city. They worked to build their own alternative commu community within the landscape of capitalism and private property. When the move decided to try to work outside the system, their space was violently, violently decimated. By sanctioning the bombing, city officials intervened in the move's work towards self-determination, proving that the greatest fear of power is non-compliance, a seizure of one's own body to determine its own constituting representations and factors. If people choose not to embody the politics of the system, then the system doesn't exist. I close with my analysis of the film because it pulls together the major themes in our class. The idea that law and space constitute race is evidence in the film's narrative and visual storytelling. From film to text to artistic paintings, these scholars and artists have pulled together, um, have been pulled together 
when pulled together, create multidimensional narratives on the work of representation as it relates to law and race. Their political positioning often works to undermine the objective language of the law by highlighting the structures of power that create these systems of domination. By rendering the absent present, they excavate the very structures from which these systems are built. Hopefully this work and my reading of it inspires others to investigate the way their own experiences are constituted by law and by its representations.